Hey guys, this is John here in Los Angeles with the Alpha Channel Update for Sunday, July 28th, 2024. And I want to tell you about Legacy of a Mad Scientist. This is a awesome, awesome audiobooks, awesome science fiction fantasy adventure, followed by The Legend of Ashley Fox right here on YouTube for you to listen to 26 hours of awesome, I keep saying that word, it's really good. Science fiction as well as a PDF of this comic book, Ashley Fox, The uh, Last of Valkyrie, where she and Reverend Wolf rescue a bunch of kids from being pizzagated in the future of Los Angeles. Here's a PDF for you guys for free. And there's a reason I have this shirt out that I was wearing yesterday. This I got from Steve Rude in uh, 2005 at the San Diego Comics Con, which is going on right now down in San Diego. And the reason I bring that up, I didn't know what we were going to be talking about that today. I decided I wanted to do something different. I was a little frustrated with how Zero Number 3 ended, where Miranda, only her arm got through the teleporter. And presumably she's dead, or at least missing an arm. So I didn't read Zero Number 4 yet. And I decided to give Mr. Belmont's Smokes the Fox a read. I have Smokes the Fox and Chaney the Werewolf. I think is that what it's called or no? What's it called? Weaponized Werewolf. I should be able to read that better without my glasses. This is an autographed virgin copy, so no, I didn't know the title. But this is the Weaponized Werewolf with a glorious cover, I have to say, from Belmont Press. And this is Smokes the Fox. I have two copies of Smokes the Fox, and it came with... Uh, Really nice foil card here. So I dropped this pristine comic book off the couch. It's a really nice metal card. But uh, as nice as the comic is, I'm not doing it any disservice by throwing it off the couch. Um, unfortunately, this comic is the work of several people. And each person is a little bit, one person more removed from the creator than the creator himself. I think his name is Michael Belmont. Smokes the Fox, Lee Oaks, Rodney Ramos is the anchor. Writers Mike Barron, which is why I've, I had uh, Steve Rude's shirt out here. Mike Barron and <clears throat> Steve Rude did Nexus, the sci-fi adventure that I haven't read yet, with the guy who looks like Cyclops. Justin Belmont. Justin Belmont. So here's the problem with Smokes the Fox. I love the idea. This is a sunk cost fallacy. Um, this is a, an awesome idea. It's a great idea. It's hard to get it wrong. Unfortunately, you guys, this team, you did. I think everybody they brought on board diluted the original concept and made it less than. Let me explain what I mean. This had a potential to be really, really fucking good. This is the cover. The concept is a, a, a werewolf and a werefox get loose from an underground scientific laboratory. And basically the werewolf named Chaney is sent to chase the fox named Smokes. Apparently he's named Smokes because of his eyes. The problem is they hired a grizzled veteran comic book writer, Mike Barron, who should be writing Batman Adventures and Bane and The Punisher to do what really should be a dark version of Bloom County or a more adult version of Calvin and Hobbes. This is like Howard the Duck. I don't know if Howard the Duck had any fans, but I, I guess a lot of people liked it. I wasn't one of the people. I didn't get it. But this starts off with a police officer and his wife out for a camping trip, and apparently they're very much in love. So it starts off with like some weird X-Files thing, and then she's missing, and we don't know what happened to her. Oh, also, this is 16 years ago. Uh, I believe it says so right up here. 16 years ago, this girl goes missing and is never found, and no one knows what happened to her. And luckily, I have Smokes the Fox and Weaponized Werewolf. 
These books should have the same title. These books should be Smokes the Fox 1 and 2. That would mean that Smokes the Fox isn't actually in book 1. That's not my problem. Uh, this book doesn't know what it wants to be. This book is a straight version of a comedy. This book should be a comedy like Bloom County, but it should be an adventure comedy. The characters, like look at this, the female doctor and the tough G.I. Joe guy. They're cliche characters. Their names aren't important. They don't do or say anything important. All of this is lit. It, the colorist didn't, didn't bring anything to the table. He detracted horribly. The pencils are not shocking enough for what should be shocking. The story has an opportunity to introduce these aliens in a very dramatic way, but it's done really flatly. This book could be awesome. And the only reason it isn't is because these players are not playing well together because they don't have a unified vision because I, I, ultimately the problem with this book is that the writer is not the artist. And the writer is not even the writer. The creator is the writer and the writer is just the author. He should be a ghost writer, but they took him because he's got name recognition, the way you would hire an actor. And unfortunately, he didn't execute this story the way this story needed to be executed. Look at this character. Look at this character. He's cartoony, whereas everyone else is bad G.I. Joe. It doesn't work for this script. He's a sarcastic, sort of annoying, um, should be funny character, and it just misses the mark. This book could be great. This book should be redone with a new artist, but you can't really do that. This, this book made me add two items to my Alpha Channel ideals for what it means to be creating original fiction. The artwork is great. The colors are great. The story is great, but none of, the, none of them are great together. They're not great together. The sum of the parts is not greater than the whole with this. There's no magic. This should, this should be magic. This should be the big hit of the summer. And it's not. It, and it's a tragedy that it's not. It could be. But the characters are all cardboard versions of themselves. None of them really want anything or grow. They just enjoy what they what they're getting they they're all winning and you can't have a, a book where everyone's winning all the time even the people who aren't winning are like i don't know how to describe it this book could have been should have been this book is a movie with all the right actors and a writer who's done something else that's awesome but this is not a winner and it should be and someone spent a lot of money on this. Justin Belmont spent a lot of money making this. I think I caught him on Rini's stream. And I still love Rini. I have yet to read Fiendish. But I love what Rini's doing. I love that she's an author illustrator. Um, I love her show. I love her enthusiasm. I haven't read her book yet. So make that what you will. On some level, I'm a little scared. I'm not scared I'll like it. This is Weaponized Werewolf. And this tells, so the girl who went missing, this is her pregnant, and she's not going to survive the pregnancy. And this is one of their other experiments, Cheney the Werewolf. He's named Cheney after Lon Cheney. He should be named Larry after Larry Talbot. This is, again, this is a missed opportunity for a lot of comedy. This needs, this needs, this needs the tick. This needs Ben Edlund to be hired as the writer. If they'd hired Ben Edlund as the writer, this artist, Lee Oaks, I think is the penciler, or the inker, I don't know. But if, uh, if they'd hired Ben Edlund, who did the tick, 
who does tell TV, he's available. You could get him if you wanted him, if you thought of him, if you thought of the tick when you went to make this book, you'd have, I think I've been holding these a little bit too high lately, and I need to hold them just about my eye line I discovered the other day. So let me back up a couple pages just in case I held this too high, because I don't want to miss this werewolf getting into his lunch. If you guys had hired Ben Edlund, Justin Belmont, if you'd hired Ben Edlund, this would be on par with He-Man. This would be everything you want it to be. But you should have written it. You could have at least written it. You could have written it. You could have learned how to write. Okay, so maybe you couldn't learn how to illustrate, but you could learn how to thumbnail, and you could have made, you could have insisted on this being funny instead of, instead of a sci-fi TV program that takes itself too seriously without taking itself seriously. All the scientists are hot white chicks. In real life, all the scientists are not hot white chicks. I mean, they are on sci-fi shows like 12 Monkeys. That girl, ballerina, Amanda Schul, wow. I don't know if she's Jewish or not. I think she's from Canada. That girl is incredible. I think Shul is a, I found out, like a Norwegian name, which makes sense how blonde she is. Man, that girl. But then, of course, by the third episode, they had her sleeping with a black dude. On the first time she met him. Like, okay, but at least have some romance. Don't have her just be an OnlyFans. She's supposed to be a doctor. And you're ever in Haiti sleeping with the first guy she meets? But that show does also have Pyro from the X-Men, Aaron Stanford, and he's pretty cool. I like that guy. Um, so Smoke the, Smokes the Fox is an experiment in everything you should not do. Weaponized Werewolf, they should be the same name. Uh, this, is not a, this is not the way to do it. This is the Eric D. July school of studio comic book making, and it's awful. And it could be great. I don't know if any of Eric July's stuff could be great. I don't think it could. I heard them read the document cards, and I heard them read some of the books, and those books couldn't be great. I don't care what they did. Wildwood Tarot for today. It's pretty good. I don't remember what it is. I looked at it a while ago. This is a hooded man. Oh, yeah. This is fucked up. Um, the two of bows. Uh, what the fuck is his name? Oh, Decision. He doesn't look like Decision. He looks like he's terrified. He's having a bad day. Decision making is easy. When you know what you're doing, decision making is easy. And I say that because I just, I did a chest workout today, so I'm really, really happy with that. And I did four pages of the best writing I've ever done in my life. It took three days of really some deep meditation. And I came up with the dilemma. I'm going to tell you guys. I came up with a dilemma and a solution for my skater characters. Who I'm going to grab uh, the art. That is, as a matter of fact, I know if I pick this up and turn it around, I'm going to screw everything up. But my my new drafting table is right behind the uh, camera here, and I'm really happy with it. So maybe at the very end, I'll show you guys the drafting table that I picked up from Peter in Redondo Beach for twenty dollars. Thank you, Peter, so much. I owe you, this is a $1,200 table. Peter reinforced something. Uh, we had a really brief conversation while I put it into my, my car. It almost didn't fit. Um, he knew a guy I had mentioned. He wanted, was wondering what I was going to use it for. His daughter had this drafting table. She went to school for graphics and then never used it again. And I explained that I went to school for animation and then never drew. Uh, I've been working as an editor. But now uh, I was doing a comic book with a friend and, you know, working at it again. And so I want to show this off really quick. This is going to be, I don't know if this or the four pages that I just wrote are going to be what I draw first on the new drafting table. But I'm going to tell you about them. And I'm going to explain how they work and why Smokes the Fox doesn't work. And why decisions are easy when you know what you're doing. I didn't know... So I've got these two guys, right? Jamie and Warren, these two brothers, and I didn't know what their big dilemma was. I knew kind of what it was. I know they're in high school and that Jamie's a year older than Warren. 
and that Warren is the crazy brother who will do every, anything, who will sketch outside the back of a pickup truck at 40 miles an hour, not caring if he falls off or lives or dies. I know this because this is my brother, and he once did this while I was driving. And I didn't know that's what he was going to do when he jumped in the back of my pickup truck with his rollerblades that weren't on his feet when we started the drive. But then at 40 miles an hour on a country road, he's suddenly hanging off the side of my fucking pickup truck and refusing to get back in the truck. And every time I go to slow down, he makes to get back in and then he starts fucking skitching again. He never let go, thankfully, and he didn't fall down. But that's not, we did a hill bomb once and I was in shorts and I fell down and the shorts like ripped up my ass and I looked like a fucking fag skating all the way home. Luckily I had a hoodie that I tied around my waist that made me look less gay, but it sucked. He was the one who always never got hurt. And then eventually he's been hurt a lot more than me. I'm, as, a, as adults, as kids, we got, I got hurt all the time. I would go off a jump and do an endo on my bike and eat it and break open my mouth and nothing like that ever. Well, one time Sam got, we were playing baseball with empty bottles that we found in a forest preserve and a stick and Sam was the pitcher and our friend Dave said, okay, as soon as I hit it, you got a duck. And Sam was like, whatever. But Sam was really close and Dave hit it and it was a solid stick and it was a solid hit and the bottle didn't even spin. It went in a straight line glass bottle and hit my brother right in the forehead. He didn't cry or anything, but he covered up his head and then suddenly blood started pouring out from under it. And we had just gotten to the forest preserve. Our dad had just left us there. We'd been in the bush for like 20 minutes. The bottles were the first thing we found and now we had to leave. We had to find someone to come and get us and take us to the phone. So, and then I broke both my arms in uh, going into seventh grade. I think, yeah, going into seventh grade. And Sam never got, had never had a broken bone or anything like that. But as an adult, he went rafting down the Amazon and I think has wrecked his motorcycle a couple times, one time really bad. So I know these two characters. I know Jamie and I know Warren. And Warren is insane. And he'll do any trick. And he wears a football helmet for fun. And he skates in combat boots because he doesn't fucking care. And Jamie is the technical one who skates more like Chris Cole. Or he's also very much like Jamie Thomas, too. And they're having an argument. The pages that I wrote today, why I know I'm a better writer than Mike Barron, who I have no right to say this about. I haven't written, ri I haven't read Nexus, but I have written two of the best science fiction audiobooks that anyone will ever fucking read. And I'll lay that up against the guy who wrote this any day of the week. So I might be biting into Nexus, but I don't want to critique things. I don't want to do this as a critique channel. What I figured out for these two brothers is that they have inherited their parents' house. Not their parents' house, their grandparents' house. Their parents both passed away, and now their grandparents have both passed away. And Jamie has just turned 18, and he's about to graduate, and this is the first day of spring break, and they're arguing about what they're gonna do. They have enough money to get through summer, because Jamie won a really big contest. He won a few really big contests, and he hasn't had to spend any of the money. And they inherited a bunch of money from their grandparents too, but, they also have to pay $20,000 a year in property taxes to keep the house. And Jamie is going to go into the Marine Corps at the end of summer when they run out of money. And his brother's pissed and they're having an argument about what they're going to do. And I wrote four pages of it and it's really good. And I've, I know how they're going to solve it, but I'm not going to tell you guys yet because I haven't written it yet. Maybe I'll tell you guys as we go in little bits and pieces. but. This book was made with money and not with teamwork. A bunch, of a bunch of art school kids who believe in what they're doing would have come up with something better than this because they would have forced themselves because they wouldn't have put it out if they didn't believe in it. This book got made with money, not with heart. And it breaks my heart to say that, but it's true. And I think all you guys on the team will know you got paid. 
either on the front end or the back end, somehow you got paid. Somehow you did that for pay, not for love. If you did that for love, especially the colorist, man, either this is your first job or you are not, you are not, the colorist on this book is not stretching himself. He is not reaching for the stars. And I know I can say this because I love doing colors more than any other part. I love drawing and I'm really good at writing. I love doing audiobooks and I'm really good at doing audiobooks. Audiobooks take a lot of time and effort and it's usually not your stuff. Writing takes the most time and effort. Writing, if the writing isn't right, nothing else matters. You can't fix it if the writing is bad. If the writing is cliched, you can't fix it. You can't fix it in post. The artist can maybe spice it up if he's really good, as I've seen John Buscema do, with some really phoned in art from whoever, because that's the way Marvel does it. If Marvel let John Buscema draw everything based on a two paragraph synopsis or a four page synopsis, he's still doing the lines, share the writing. And having someone else come in and do the dialogue is not the same thing as calling them an author or calling them, an, calling them a writer. Even if they're doing this two, four page synopsis, even if that's Chris Claremont or Roy Thomas doing the synopsis, then John Buscema goes and draws all the emotions. You are, I don't care what you call yourself, you're not the author. You guys are doing shared story responsibilities. Unless you're writing every panel and basically doing thumbnails, which I now understand is not the Marvel way, you guys are doing shared story work. And I get why character, half the royalties go to the artists. Half of the story should go to the artists. It's not like, um, it's not like songwriting. Uh, and I think songwriting, if you're the guitarist is coming up with the guitar riff, then Slash should get songwriting credit, not just the person who writes the lyrics. If John Lennon is writing the music and the, and the lyrics, then yeah. If this, the art is half the story. In real life, they acknowledge that body, body language is 67% and tone and emphasis is 23%. So the actor provides more story than this, this screenwriter. And I don't think the budget guys would argue with you there. The actor here is the writer and the artist. And they were not working together. There's no comedy in this. And this is meant to be funny. And that's why I can say you guys missed the mark. The other reason uh, comic books have a really hard time being funny these days because to be funny you have to be timely and right now timely these days is memes you can a comic book that takes six months to a year to see print is not timely from con conception to print six months to a year easy now if you have a finely tuned machine three to four months Marvel can churn out an idea in three to four months but it, let's say the art, let's say the writer gets two weeks, the artist gets a month, the anchor gets, you know, a, an additional week because they're let's say a week behind the artist. The color is additional week, so you've got six weeks right there, eight weeks with the writer, another two weeks for lettering and whatever else editing, two and a half months, then two months or two weeks. Let's say two weeks for printing and drying. And shipping, the fastest you can do it is three months. If you've got a finely tuned machine like Marvel. Previews wants the fucking ads six months ahead of time. So the marketing people want the shit six months ahead of time. So three months. Three months is to be timely comedy. That doesn't work these days. That worked back when television shows took a year. That worked back when the, the news, you know, was as fast as anything got. And that was you know, the nightly news and the uh, the funnies, whatever you put in the newspaper. Comic books were fast back then. Not anymore. 
It's a different world now. So you can't be timely and timeless at the same time. Timeliness, all comedy is relevant to its time period. I thought about this for a while before I said it today. So go back and look. Go think about it. Even if you go so far as to mean comedy is happy endings, they are still timely. Even the timeless ones are becoming dated. Stuff like um, Zuzu's Petals, uh, Bedford Falls, the Whatever Christmas movie. Merry Christmas, Bedford Falls. What the fuck is that called? It's not Miracle on 34th Street. I should know. I acted in a play of it way, way, way once upon a time. I played that brother Harry and did an awful job because I, I was afraid to make him an asshole. I didn't commit to the character. But uh, what does that have to anything to do with what I want to talk about? I want to talk about characters. They, they have these Ayn Graham characters. I'm going to try and remember them. The first one is the reformer. Uh, the second one is the achiever. I don't know. I have a list. Where's the list? I can see it, but I can't read it. So I'm pulling it down here so I can read it. The helper is the second one. I have it on the, it's supposed to be, it's in a circle, but it doesn't really work that way. The achiever is the third one. The individualist is fourth. The investigator is fifth, the loyalist is sixth, the enthusiast is seventh, the challenger is eighth, and the peacemaker is ninth. You could see these as sort of a thing that as a um, character growth arc, but you would probably also recognize that people oftentimes get stuck at different places along the way. And I certainly would not go so far as to say that every CEO is a peacemaker. Although ultimately, the best CEOs that I've worked with, that is their role. That is absolutely their role, is peacemaker. Whereas the challenger is also the leader character. Um, another way to say a challenger is the dickhead or the Nazi. The enthusiast is the true believer. This is like... Stan Lee leading from the front, sticking to, to positive values while letting his characters be less than virtuous. I was thinking about this a lot today. The ways that Marvel and DC have managed their comic brands are never more stark than today. In the 60s and 70s, Marvel wrote about bad people doing good things while DC Comics wrote about good people facing ultimate evil, decided evil. And that had a lot to do with the good Westerns of the 60s and the 70s. The best Westerns, the ones that stand out to this day, are the Sergio Leone Catholic Westerns, the Spaghetti Westerns that came out of Italy. I read an article about this. I'm not taking full credit for this concept, but it's true. The Catholic Westerns were the bad ones, where the bad guys knew they were bad guys, and they were bad guys deliberately. Marvel's bad guys are a lot like what the Jewish um, mafiosa and the Jewish Western movies were about with moral relativism. Because Jews have been trying to push moral relativism the entire time they've been in Hollywood. And what you've got is so these two different schools of thought between Marvel and DC. And in Marvel, the moral relativism, they were essentially good guys doing bad things like Logan and the Punisher. Whereas DC, you've got Batman and Superman who are good guys facing ultimate evil like Thanos or whoever else, the Joker, right? And they're very different story archetypes that they're wanting to tell. And now they've painted themselves into these corners where... Everything at Marvel is degenerate and gay, and everything at DC is Sith Lord. That's what Disney's done. Disney had to go, the inversion of the Force was the Sith Lord, whereas the inversion of Marvel is just incompetent and stupid, basically. Lame, which is what we really meant when we called someone a faggot when we were kids. We meant, you're lame. Well, why don't you just say they're lame? Oh, then you get mad at us for calling them retards. Well, okay, that's not fair to retards. Well, who can we make fun of? We can make fun of white guys. You're all Nazis. So that's where we're at today. 
And so my Nazi story is about these two brothers who don't know how to plot their future because Warren is a problem for himself and everyone around him. He's a live hand grenade. Jamie is the pin on that hand grenade. And Jamie, if Jamie decides to go off to the Marine Corps to pay for their parents' house, Warren is one bad injury away from a full-blown drug addiction. And he will go pro, but inside of six months, as everyone knows, he'll be hurt and he won't get his year-long bonus. And he'll get, he'll get dropped from whatever shoe sponsorship he gets. And everyone's seen that play out over and over and over again. So these brothers have a dilemma and they don't know how to solve it. I do know who the, the solution character is. I don't know whether this is going to be Modern Savages Book Zero, Spring Break. I think that's probably what it's going to be. Um, probably a short book, like 12 pages, maybe 16 or 18, certainly not 22. Um, it's not, it doesn't need full 22 pages. And I know what book number one is. That's the, this is the cover of book number one. So that's a different story. And, you know, they, these guys did two issues and it's one story. And the story is really about the cop and his wife who went missing and gave birth to Smokes the Fox and why they aren't a family. That would be hilarious, absurd, um, I can see six or eight dilemmas in there. If you'd made the husband one of the soldiers and not a cop, and there's a million ways you could have made that funny and irreverent and timeless and timely. Um, and I'm, like I said, that's why I'm a writer. Because I, so this, that's what's called sunk cost fallacy. There's nothing more dangerous than a good idea. And this leads me to my two added uh, my two added alpha channel ideals. The first seven I should be able to give you without looking at this, and as well as the last two. They are, one, do the work with a clear conscience. Two, love the doing of the work. Three, do it for no money. Four, use values as virtues. Five, uh, use nature as inspiration when you run out of inspiration. Six, never do propaganda. Don't do it for your side. Don't do it against the other side. And certainly don't take money to do it for the other side. You will destroy your soul. So that's six. Seven, your direction is your destination. Your character is your destiny. Eight, master the tools. Nine, craft the experience. And that gives you a master at your craft. Master the tools, all the tools, master the writing, the lettering, the penciling, the inking, the coloring, audio, video game. If you want to be a studio, Belmont Press, Justin Belma, take the money and invest it in classes, learning how to do this stuff so that when you hire an artist, you can speak their language. You hired the wrong writer. If you'd hired Ben Edlund, he would have given you the smokes the fox you want. My advice to you is to go hire him. Eventually I'll get to fiendish. And I hope I love that as much as I love Reen's personality on camera. So, but the last one, craft the experience you want to give to your audience. Know what experience you want them to have and set out with that in mind. Because I did that for two novels, I'm now free to do that for any kind of story I want. And I did this one with someone else, but I was really attached to this. I did all the drawings for this first. All these drawings that you see here, I did a version of all of these first. And I have it, and I can show it to you, and I found it, and I forgot that I had it. Jay's work is so good that I forgot that I drew all this shit before he did. Because he made me look like an amateur. He made me look like a wannabe storyboard artist. Not even good enough to be a storyboard artist for TV. But I had only done preliminary thumbnails to write the story. I was writing in thumbnails. I was writing in images. From now on with Jay, all he gets is text. Because it is crushing for me. I, I, I love drawing. I don't like having my art taken 
and knowing that I have to, the best thing I can do with it is burn it because I owe him $150,000 for what he did in this book. Easy, easy. I owe him that much money. And I can't sell that. I can't sell it because we didn't have teamwork. We weren't working together. And what we wanted to produce for the audience wasn't the same experience. I wanted to produce something way closer to an episode of Bruce Timm's Batman. He wanted to produce something closer to Thundercats. And that's enough of a difference that you're not aiming at the same thing. It's not as bad as this. The only thing going for this is the artwork. The artwork is awesome. The colors are too straight down the middle, but I suspect that the colorist, excuse me, was rushed. Um, <clears throat> this should be rewritten and I don't, I don't know if, see, I apparently I've got a case of the hiccups. I don't know if it needs to be redrawn, but it should definitely be recolored. I'm not volunteering to do it. Uh, volunteering to do it. That has to be a work of passion by, the, by the, someone who absolutely loves the character. The same way this needed to be. But this has given me, I am now disconnected from how my writing looks on the page. This was an, enough of a heartbreaker. The way Chris Cole being canceled is I'm sure enough of a heartbreaker for him. Um, I was on the Garage Days site and I saw that all the Chris Cole boards have been taken down, but they didn't take his name down yet. This is not going to break me of zero. Zero is still my brand. I'm now just going to collect Chris Cole boards. I wish I had enough money to buy one this payday. I bought a $20 um, drafting table. In a moment, I'll get up and show that to you guys. What I didn't buy was a $100 investment in Cliff High's uh, company because next payday I'm putting $200 into it. I had to pay a car payment and insurance and internet and rent. July's rent isn't even paid yet. I only paid half of it. So whatever. I'm the happiest motherfucker I know because I did the best four pages of writing in my life. A dilemma between these two brothers who if the older brother leaves, he knows he's setting, he knows he's setting his younger brother on a path towards drug addiction and homelessness. And it's, it's, I'm captivated by the story. I can't wait to see what happens with these two brothers. I'm, I am writing the way Robert E. Howard writes. I named this company Alpha Channel for a couple of reasons. One of them I'm not going to tell you guys about just yet. But Robert E. Howard, when he came up with Conan, um, he said that he was writing one night. It was really hot in the summer in Texas, and he left the door open, or he left it unlocked, the screen door. The main door opened and the screen door unlocked. And someone came in behind him, and he saw the silhouette of a giant man with an axe. And the man said, you're going to write what I tell you. You're going to write my story. And if you turn around, I'm going to cleave your head in twain with this axe. And that man was Conan. And he wrote those stories. It doesn't matter whether it's true or not. It's an awesome story. The story of Conan is that two-sentence, one-paragraph story of how he came up with it. And the story of these two brothers that I have like laid out is a story about that I just told you guys, but I mean, when I write, once I know who the characters are, they tell the story, and I just listen and write it down. And that's what I did today, and it's the best feeling. It's the best, it's a blessing. It is a blessing. Whether or not anyone ever gets to see it, I got to tell you guys. A couple people got to hear about it, and I promise you, if you check this shit out, you will not be disappointed. If you recognize the dilemma between the two brothers that I just uh, talked about, and you could see that being a story, then yeah, I know what I'm doing. So, Mike Barron, I'm not going to go looking for your masterpiece because I believe it's out there because a lot of people have faith in you. 
Snopes the Fox ain't it. And I think you were just hired to do something that was not in your wheelhouse, as they say. Um, it wouldn't have been in mine. I'm not the right guy. I would have turned the job down. Ben Edlund is the right guy to hire for that. It should have been the guy who did the tick. So, so yeah, I think I've gone on enough for one night. See you guys tomorrow. All right, guys, so here it is. The new, at least new to me, drafting table. Look at how big it is. I got so lucky. Yeah, I got so lucky.